This is Demetrius Binrat. And this is Isaac Meyer. And you're listening to Criminal Records Podcast, a podcast about some of the weirdest cases in true crime history. And this is one of those juicy episodes where I get to name an episode The Bloody Code and go on for a very long time about a particularly brutal system of criminal punishment. But this is also a bit of a corrections episode. Because I have brought up the period of British history that gets called the Bloody Code uh, quite a few times in past episodes. We've covered uh, the 18th and 19th century British law a lot, but I have focused too much on the letter of the law, and I've given listeners a somewhat inaccurate impression of how that law was actually put into practice. Because the thing about running a true crime podcast is that you tend to focus on extreme and unusual cases so you don't often get to take a step back to look at the research uh, more generally about how the law is being applied across large numbers of cases, uh, which is quite different from how it was applied in extreme and unusual cases. So I wanted to do a bit of a corrections episode and go into more detail about what it was actually like to live under this legal system. Yeah, I mean, I guess the thing is when you are doing cases that are particularly famous after centuries from a period where really the main punishments are either execution or I guess being shipped to Australia. Like by definition, if you were famous enough that we're still talking about you, that's probably not good for you in the short term in terms of your, uh, your sentencing outcomes, shall we say, but that's also not most people. Yeah. So today I thought I would uh, go through the bloody code, uh, basically how Britain got started with capital punishment, because that it has a very long history in the legal tradition uh, what the period that is called the Bloody Code actually is, uh, why it got started, and uh, sort of why these laws were building up, and uh, then some some about what these laws were actually like in practice, because there are actually some wacky legal technicalities involved there. And then at the end, I want to give you a little teaser about some of the problems that the criminal justice system had to deal with when it ended, because that is so wild. It's actually going to be the focus of an entire separate episode because I couldn't just squeeze it in at the end. That had to be its own thing. Oh, we're foreshadowing here. I like it. <laughs> so uh, first, we have to go way back in time. And uh, before we can really start talking about why people were trying so hard to make Britain's legal system so humane, we have to talk about what made it inhumane in the first place. And that is not just the existence of capital punishment, because capital punishment has been part of English law for a very, very long time. Um, as a matter of fact, it's been part of legal codes all over Europe and all over the world for a very long time. I mean, it, the Code of Hammurabi has capital punishment in it. The idea of killing people for committing a crime is not new. Oh yeah, we still haven't done the Code of Hammurabi. Future episode right there. <laughs> yeah, obviously we're not going to rewind quite that far in this episode because then working up to our episode topic would take a ridiculously long time. Um, so I do want to set the stage for what capital punishment looks like in England before the Bloody Code. So. I do want to say your image of capital punishment in the medieval and early modern periods of England might be somewhat skewed by Hollywood. Uh, for instance, those witch burnings that you've seen in lots of movies about the Middle Ages, those really got going uh, quite a bit later than you've been led to believe. But it is true that English legal codes did make use of the death penalty. And uh, the criminal justice system in the Middle Ages also sometimes made very creative use of the horrible things you could do to a body before and after death. So it wasn't just putting someone to death as the punishment. There's also an element of torture, both as interrogation and punishment. And there's additional defacing of a corpse after death. So uh, there's a lot more than just dying involved in punishment. But here's the thing, the list of things that you could be sentenced to death for actually wasn't all that long. Uh, capital punishment was for the really big offenses, things like murder, rape, treason, arson, heresy, coin clipping. You can't have people going around clipping those coins, you know? Oh man, someday when you're in the mood to get really depressed about Jewish history, uh, we'll cover the coin clipping crisis of the of the 1270s, because that is a really, really big historical event. 
I'll, uh, I'll save that one for another time, I think. Yeah. So although the law is by no means lenient, especially if you are a member of a minority group, like if you're Jewish or Roma, uh, there is a basic logic at work here. Death is a punishment for crimes that are big enough to be really potentially destabilizing to the social order, to the currency system, to the safety of a town if you're setting buildings on fire, to the family structure if you are uh, raping women, which in the legal system at the time doesn't just doesn't just mean sexual assault. It can mean force, forcibly abducting women away from marriage. Uh, so basically, if you are facing the death penalty, it is for a big, serious crime, one that the the legal system considers one of the big, bad ones. It is possible to be executed for theft, poaching, robbery, other property crimes on that level, but jumping straight to capital punishment isn't necessarily that common. Uh, and here's one of the delightfully complicated things about the English legal system, because we are talking about a common law system that various people have attempted to standardize at various times. The English legal system actually uh, divided up thefts by severity under the Statute of Westminster in 1275. That is a very hefty legal document that attempts to take England's gigantic mess of common laws. So every time a ruling is made and it, it is a precedent, it becomes part of common law. It takes that humongous mess, which still has uh, things about taxation for Viking prevention and stuff like that in it. And it, ta it attempts to take that and turn it into 51 chapters of somewhat more functional legal code. They kept the Viking stuff though, right? Because you can't trust those guys. They're playing the long game. <laughs> <laughs> All that, that Ikea stuff is just laying the groundwork. So the Prisoners and Bail Act section of that statute separates grand larceny, which is big larceny, out from petite larceny, which is petty or small larceny. And petty larceny is larceny for which one ought not to lose life or member. So no bits chopped off, including the important ones. Yes. So there is a level of theft that you can do that you should not be executed for and you should not have any bits chopped off for. And the bits chopping off part is a very relevant here. This does not mean that thieves walked off with no punishment at all if they committed petty larceny. The justice system had lots of other punishments that it could mete out that were less severe than the death penalty, but still very severe. I am not talking about jail and community service here. I am talking about brutal corporal punishment. And that punishment was frequently castration. So a really important bit getting chopped off. Yeah. In 1198, the punishment for hunting deer in the king's forest was blinding and castration. Uh, that actually was walked back in 1217 to a fine uh, in a charter because that was considered a bit too severe, a bit too much to lose for hunting deer. Uh, but that is just an example of when one of the many crimes that could get you mutilation or castration. Uh, several kings in the 1100s were really big on castration. I actually found entire papers of legal history about a couple of kings who were just real big on chopping people's bits off. You know, I think we can change the subject now as a good <laughs> chunk of this listener base is now squeezing their legs ever closer together. Okay, so let's say castration is off the table. Your bits are safe. Oh, thank God. Even if you are not sentenced to a capital punishment, it is possible that the corporal punishment that you are sentenced to comes with a non-zero chance of death. Uh, we've talked a bit in previous episodes about the pillory. Uh, you know those ye olde wooden stocks that you take cute, a cute picture in at the Renaissance Fair? That was actually something that could blur the line between capital and corporal punishment, uh, because people were allowed to throw things at you while you were in the pillory. And whether you died could depend on how angry that crowd was and what they chose to throw at you. So people very much did die of being pilloried. And then there are things like uh, mutilation, even if it's not as severe as blinding. If it's things like having your e your hand cut off, even your ear cut off, or being flogged bloody in the age before antibiotics... Uh, that's not a light sentence by any means. If those wounds get infected, you could very severely suffer or you could die. Uh, that's, that is pretty harsh punishment. 
So the early English justice system is not what we would consider humane by modern standards. But it is true that there are a pretty broad range of offenses that can get you a punishment that are more along the lines of a fine or extra work. And then the Tudor era comes along. And uh, while we, we have a really hard time accurately tallying up how many people were being executed at different periods, it does seem like capital punishments do start ticking up in the Tudor period. How high up they go is a matter of some historical debate, uh, especially how high up, how far up executions go under Henry VIII in particular. 72,000 hangings is a frequently quoted figure under Henry VIII, uh, but it doesn't seem like that number is terribly accurate. Uh, criminologist Thorsten Sellen attempted to trace those numbers back to the source and found them very iffy. Yeah, I mean, I have a hard time believing he married that many people. <laughs> I do want to point out, however, that in addition to killing some of his wives, Henry VIII did kill a good chunk of his subjects because the definition of heresy, which is one of which is one of the crimes for which you can be sentenced to death, changes quite a bit under Henry VIII and his successors. All of a sudden, a bunch of people who had been law-abiding citizens are suddenly heretics because they are not recognizing the new church that they live under and thus suddenly become guilty of one of the top-tier crimes. This would be, for those who are not too familiar with English history, when Henry VIII decides to found a new church, the Church of England, uh, out of deep Christian conviction, as I recall, strong feelings about theology. Right, Demetria? Oh, boy. I don't want to piss off anyone who's Anglican here, but uh, there were some political I, moves. They know. This one. They all know. I assume <laughs> they teach this in, in a British history class. Yeah, Henry wanted a divorce, and the Pope wouldn't give him a divorce. Or an annulment, technically, right? Mm -hmm. And so he's, he's just like, I'll make my own church then and annul myself. And Well, okay, he makes his own church, but here's the crucial thing is he ties church and state together in a way that it hadn't previously been tied which means that a lot of crimes that used to be handled by ecclesiastical courts are suddenly covered by the king's laws instead. And a bunch of things that had, had um, previously been handled in courts that you probably wouldn't have gotten put to death for, all of a sudden, capital punishment is on the table. I don't know why you would draw that distinction. I mean, when has it ever been prob problematic to combine church and state? Well, it, we've talked in quite a few previous episodes about the Buggery Act 1533, uh, which both made buggery a capital offense and spectacularly failed to define what buggery actually is, producing centuries of brutal repression and podcast content for us. Uh, that was previously something that the church was handling. That was a sin. The church handles that. Now it's a crime. The state handles that and the state hangs you for it. And there is a, a certain incentive here to find more people who could be guilty of capital offenses because some of Henry's new laws make it so that the government, not the offenders next of kin, get to take their land and possessions after death. That is a certain incentive to be free with the death penalty if someone has a particularly juicy bit of property that you would like you would like to have as the king. I mean, and I'm sure that Henry VIII resisted that impulse and used the justice system only for the most noble of pursuits. Famously fair and balanced guy, Henry yes. VIII. Famously a man who cared deeply about justice. And by justice, I mean more, more money, more bitches. And even if Henry had been sticking very fairly to the laws, uh, while I mentioned earlier that not all larceny was punishable by death, the threshold for grand larceny in this period is quite a bit lower than you might expect. Uh, you could be hanged for stealing goods worth more than a shilling in this period, and a shilling is a 20th of a pound. It's very hard to do currency conversion going back this far, uh, because in addition to inflation, you also have to count for the fact that the cost of living and the value of things is completely different. The best I could do to compare it to modern currency is to say it's a little less than two weeks of a soldier's food allowance. So you can get hanged for stealing about the equivalent of two weeks of a guy's groceries. 
So this is still a pretty harsh sentence to get. I assume that in the theory here is the classic, well, it's deterrence and it'll keep people from stealing and therefore, you know, work out great and bring an end to all crime. And that's exactly what it does, right? Oh, exactly. But we are still talking about the 15 and 1600s and the era of the bloody code doesn't really get rolling until the 1700s. So what happens that makes the law even worse than it currently is? And it is currently sounding not great. Let's take a look at where Britain is at in the early 1700s. It does well in some wars abroad. It has quite a few colonies around the globe. In spite of war expenses, the state is doing quite well for itself financially, and some Britons are benefiting from the nation's prosperity. But not all. 5% of the population are getting 30% of the income. And that is causing what I would say is some pretty understandable resentment. Oh yeah, that's ridiculous. What kind of society would have a wealth imbalance like that? My goodness me, what could we possibly be comparing this to? In 1720, after taking over the nation's debt and uh, also taking in a massive amount of investments from speculators in a pre-Ponzi Ponzi scheme, the South Sea Company's value collapses. This crash coincides with several other speculative bubbles collapsing in England and Western Europe at around the same time. It's the first economic event that can be considered an international stock market crash. And the economic depression that follows certainly does its part in keeping that resentment about the haves and the have-nots building. So... Starting in 1721, several groups of men get inspired by Robin Hood stories. Yes, really, they get inspired by Robin Hood. And they decide to start stealing from the rich to give to themselves. A very noble of them. Very, no very noble that, of course, in helping the poor, they would think, well, I'm the poor, so I will start with me. I mean, obviously seems pretty logical. There's a poor guy right here. Might as well enrich him. So a group in Hampshire starts the trend, uh, taking to the forest to do some exciting foresty crimes. Possibly the reason that they start doing this particularly is because they're trying to get revenge on their local bishop. The previous bishop had let locals poach deer in the forest without consequences, but then a new bishop comes in, starts enforcing consequences, and cuts off their access to that sweet, sweet venison. So four poachers get arrested in the first incident, two get convicted and sentenced to a 20-pound fine, standing in the pillory and being imprisoned for a year and a day. So keep this particular punishment in mind as we get deeper into the story. This is the level of punishment that is being doled out in the early 1720s for poaching. But then due to this initial punishment, uh, groups this group starts ramping up its vengeance upon the stingy bishop, and other groups around the area join in. It's not clear how cohesive this actually was as any formal movement. These criminals end up being referred to as the Waltham Blacks because some of them are operating in an area near the village of Waltham Chase, and or an area called Waltham Forest, and they like to disguise themselves by blacking their faces. So they're going around in the forest in disguise, um, basically covering their faces with soot. In addition to poaching large amounts of the bishop's deer, they kill some and just leave them rotting in the forest as an especially obvious fuck you to the bishop. And then they start branching out into other crimes, like harassing landowners who had received damages for crimes committed on their lands. Uh, like uh, there were reasons why people would sometimes go strip bark off trees, and that was a crime if you did that on someone, someone else's property. So some landowners who prosecuted for that crime uh, then got retaliated against. They also really liked targeting widows whose husbands had been forest rangers and who had benefited from fines levied against poachers. In one of their most famous crimes, the Waltham Blacks steal a consignment of French wine. When they're told by the people who are transporting the wine that this was intended for the Prince of Wales, they say, quote, they now had got forthwith to make a festival and drink his health. 
So they're told that they're stealing directly from the prince who will who is going to become the future king, and they say, "All right, we will use the stolen wine to toast to his health." Very Robin Hood of them. I mean, classic English patriots. I mean, I my understanding of English history is that there's a long tradition of taking things that don't belong to you. So it seems like it's just in keeping with that. Yeah, but uh, stealing directly from the crown prince is just it's it's not done. It's not polite. I am not, I am absolutely serious about these guys being mostly a gang of Robin Hood cosplayers. Uh, They like targeting rich people. They have some very legitimate and topical reasons to be resentful of the upper classes. And it is true, they do seem more calculated than most gangs in the way they, they choose their targets. They go after specific people and they take revenge on people who have tried to prosecute them instead of just taking some unattended deer out of the forest like your more survival poacher would do. And this organization is starting to make people in power very nervous because this does not appear to be any old gang of poachers. This looks like an organized conspiracy. And here's the thing about the early 1700s. People in power are worried about conspiracies Because around every corner, there could be secret Jacobites plotting to overthrow the king and install the old pretender in his place. So this is probably where we need to go over what the Jacobite Rebellion is, right? Yes. Oh, my God. Okay. This is quite complicated. (laughs) Uh, Two different people said God made them the king of England, and one of those people was a Catholic. And so a lot of English people didn't like that. But a a small number of them, mostly Scots, actually, not English, as I recall, were more into that. Am I getting Mm -hmm. it? Or was it it Catholic or two different flavors of Protestant? Oh, Oh, Lord, I can't. (laughs) Who can can even remember? Basically, things got messy after the English Civil War, from what I remember. And there's a fight over who gets to be king. And the losing size descended from uh, one of the Jameses. And therefore, by the Lat- the Latinization of that as Jacob into the Jacobites. Yes, so they're like yes. supporters of that that uh, pretender branch to the monarchy. Mm-hmm. James II gets deposed. And then the problem is that his uh, descendants are still living overseas. So there's still a figurehead for this movement. And that's why the people in power are so very nervous, because there's actually a figurehead of the of this movement who could be installed as king. So there are politicians, chief among them a man named Sir Robert Walpole, who very much stand to benefit from stirring up fears about these secret Jacobite conspiracies that must be stamped out. And uh, actually, in fairness to him, there was a genuine Jacobite conspiracy around this time that made a lot of news and made a lot of people very anxious. Uh, I'll probably cover that in a separate episode because it is a wild one. But the relevant thing to understand here is that people in power are very worried that any organized gang that seems to be targeting people in power could actually have a political motive and could have uh, potentially be an actual rebellion forming. So a crackdown begins against the Waltham Blacks, and the situation escalates. A gamekeeper's son gets killed in a dust-up, and this gives the government evidence that the blacks are dangerous. When a baron who is involved in the Jacobite cause gets arrested, investigators become convinced that the blacks are being recruited to support the cause of James Francis Edward Stuart, who is the son of the deposed King James II of England. And so... The government passes the Black Act 1723. This act introduces a new and very intentionally broad list of crimes that can be capital offenses. This list directly targets the behavior of the Waltham Blacks and groups in other areas operating in the same way like the Berkshire Blacks. And it's basically a very long list of all of the things that the Blacks have been doing, like quote, being armed with swords, firearms, or other offensive weapons, and having his or their faces blacked or being otherwise disguised, end quote, while in a forest, in areas where game is kept, in high roads or other wild spaces, 
all of those offenses are now punishable by death. So if you're walking around with your face blacked and you happen to have uh, like a knife on you and you are uh, walking around on a public road, potential death penalty. That seems, I mean, I, you know, I get being worried about rebellion, but that seems extreme, particularly in a period where like, you might just have a weapon on you because the highways are kind of dangerous. Oh, you think this is extreme? It gets worse. You want to know how much worse it gets? I can't wait. Okay, also punishable by death now are crimes like fishing where you're not supposed to, hunting hares where you're not supposed to, destroying trees, killing cattle, destroying fish ponds, burning property like houses or corn and hay stores, attempting to rescue other people who had been arrested for doing any of these things, or soliciting other people to do any of these things. So the theory here is, if I'm following correctly, we have to kill people who fish in the wrong spot, because in fishing in the wrong spot, they could be part of a secret conspiracy, I assume with the fish somehow, to bring back the deposed Jacobite monarchy. Now you are thinking like renowned English statesman Sir Robert Walpole. That, man, I'm so glad we kicked these nerds out of uh, out of our part of North America. <laughs> oh man! Oh, don't don't get too high and mighty though, because uh, North America is not going to come off great at the end of this episode either. Hey, I mean, I'll take it while I can. Also, I do want to point out, I did look really quickly while we were going through some of this stuff. There is still a Jacobite line of succession, and it goes through currently the monarchy of Liechtenstein. So. You know, British people, it's not too late. I think this is your way out of Brexit. Like, There's still a chance. There's still a chance. Bring them back. They can get back into the Eurozone. Let them sit on the Stone of Scones, even screams. <laughs> it's all part of the cinematic universe. So 32 people are arrested and tried as blacks in the first round of criminal prosecutions. Only four are actually sentenced to death for their part in the murder of the gamekeeper's son, which, again, that was something that was already a capital offense. That was not actually a new law that was introduced specifically by the Black Act. Most of the initial round of convicts actually get sentenced for regular old po poaching, and some of those get condemned not to death but to penal transportation which is still a, a very harsh punishment for poaching, uh, being told, like, you don't get to live in this country anymore. You are now a convict who has to do labor on the other side of the world. That's harsh, but it is not a capital punishment. But this is not enough for Sir Robert Walpole. He presses investigators to go after the instigators of this totally real Jacobite conspiracy that definitely needs to be stamped out for the safety of the kingdom. He writes to investigators on the ground that the law needs to dole out exemplary punishment. Those are his words specifically, exemplary punishment by hanging those seven poachers. Walpole is big on the whole idea of exemplary punishment for some. I should note that his nickname as a politician around this time was the Screen or Screen Master General because he had screened some of the biggest players in the South Sea bubble from punishment with his personal influence. So if you're a se totally real secret Jacobite who is plotting to kill some deer to piss off a bishop, no mercy. If you are responsible for a massive speculative bubble that completely destroys English England's economy, no punishment needed. You'll learn your lesson. Uh, that doesn't sound familiar from anywhere. <laughs> So seven more people do get condemned to death in the end, uh, in part thanks to this political influence, and the Waltham Blacks do fall apart, because in the end, they are not actually a far-ranging conspiracy to overthrow the king. They're just an unusually well-organized group of Robin Hood cosplayers. So if the Black Act alone had stayed on the books, that would have been bad enough, uh, Various people have sort of attempted to individually tally up every possible crime uh, that the Black Act adds to the uh, list of things that you could be uh, hanged for. By some counts, it's above 300 because it's just like a really, really long list of things. So that's bad enough. 
But as the years go on, politicians pass more and more acts that expand the list of capital crimes even further. For comparison here, in the 1680s, there are 50 capital statutes on the books. By 1820, there are over 200 capital statutes on the books. So under this legal system, you can get sentenced to death for such dastardly crimes as stealing from a shipwreck. That was a big one, actually. There are a lot of really big cases of stealing from shipwrecks. Concealing your stillborn child if you're an unwed mother. So not causing your child to be stillborn, just concealing the fact that you had a stillborn. Begging without a license if you're a soldier or sailor. That is a capital offense. Residing for more than a month in a Roma encampment. You can see here, specific groups are being targeted here. Forgery. Oh, that's a big one, and we're going to talk about that a bit later. Forgery, capital offense. Coming back home to England if you've been transported to the Americas, Australia, or Africa for another crime. If you commit a crime, you get sentenced, and you say, uh, no, thank you, I'd rather go back to England, that's a capital offense. And being as young as seven years old and committing a crime with evidence of malice, that can be a capital offense under this system. You know, I mean, I don't know how any of this is going to stop the Grand Jacobite conspiracy. I'm going to be honest with you. Nip it in the bud, start them young. I mean, a lot of seven-year-olds have a great fondness for the old pretender. I, I am sure they do. So one of the more well-known justifications for this brutally punitive justice system comes from George Saville, who is an English politician and essayist. And I wanted to quote this particular one. Uh, he's known for his, he, he did a lot of writing because he, he liked to be known for his wit. But I thought in this particular case, he, it's good that he be known for his uh, particularly weird, uh, his particularly weird thought process. So quote, wherever a government knows when to show the rod, it will not often be put to use it. But between the want of skill and the want of honesty, Faults generally either escape punishment or are mended to no purpose. Men are not hanged for stealing horses, but that horses may not be stolen. So do you get what he's saying here? He's saying, it's not that I want to put loads of people to death. It's that if people know that the punishment for crimes is death, they won't commit any crimes and I won't have to put anyone to death. As supported by millennia of evidence going back to the Code of Hammurabi, which obviously ended all crime as we know it. Yeah, as you might be able to tell from Isaac's sarcasm here, this absolutely does not work as a crime prevention technique. We don't have national crime figures from the 18th century. This is a bit before the standardization of some of his kind of crime reporting. We do know that theft increased between 1750 and 1850 with a particularly huge increase in petty theft. Why? It turns out that there's this little thing happening at the same time called the Industrial Revolution. You might have heard of that one. When that kicks off, it causes overcrowding in cities. It causes a massive population boom. There are huge upheavals in the way people make their living, and a lot of people who had previously been pretty well-off, pretty well-trained artisans suddenly do not have those career paths to fall back on. But as some people are getting poorer, other people are getting richer. There's a wider range of middle-class people who can be stolen from. And in the middle of all this, there are a few ma there are a few wars in the British Empire that result in mass layoffs and desperate retraining veterans who can't find employment. Are you suggesting, Dimitri, the crime rate is primarily a function not of actually the deterrence policy, but of economic conditions? Let's see what Fox News has to say about that. So, let's get to the correction portion of this episode. Yes, it is true that on the books, the English populace could be sentenced to death for a massive range of crimes, just a huge, huge range of potential crimes here. But were huge numbers of people actually being executed for all of these newly created crimes? This is the complicated part. 
if you take a look at what people were actually getting put to death for in the 18th century, so during the era of the rise of the Bloody Code, you will find that most of them are actually being sentenced under laws from the 16th century. So hundreds of years before the Bloody Code even got started, these are still the same laws that are being applied in most cases involving capital punishment. So even though there are hundreds of new capital offenses on the books in all of these statutes, most of the people who are actually being put to death by the state are being executed for things that were capital offenses before those statutes were passed. All of these new laws are not hugely increasing the number of people who fall into the category of criminals who are in practice condemned to death. Why is that? Because while there are more capital offenses in number on the books, a lot of those laws are actually carving out really narrow offenses. Like, uh, for instance, destroying one specific bridge. So that not a statute saying you can't destroy bridges, a statute saying you can't destroy this one specific bridge. Or, for instance, uh, committing specific kinds of forgery in one specific administrative county. So good news if you are forging land registers in the East Riding of Yorkshire, it is a capital offense to forge land registers in the North Riding of Yorkshire. That's how narrow some of these statutes are. All right, perfect crime is still, uh, still in the books. And, okay, here's where we're going to get real deep into the absolute wildness of the English justice system in practice. Even if you are committing crimes that could be capital offenses, who is going to catch you? Remember, this is the era before a professionalized police force. Your fellow citizens do have a legal obligation to stop criminals and to stop crimes if they see them happening. This is the era of the hue and cry. Uh, your fellow citizens are obligated to raise a hue and cry if they see a crime happening. But realistically speaking, are members of your own community going to narc on you if they know that your punishment might be death? And are they going to remember which writing of Yorkshire it's illegal to forge in? Yeah, um, the likelihood that your, your fellow citizens are well-versed enough in the law to fully understand what is going on legally in their specific administrative county could be quite low. Even if someone does narc on you, there is another funny feature of a legal system without police, which is that very few prosecutions are actually a representative of the law expending the state's resources to try and accuse criminal purely because the state believes the criminal should be tried. Which is basically, I mean, it's the legal system we live under today, um, which I it, it so infuses our way of thinking that it's kind of hard to wrap your brain around the idea of a legal system not working like this. But that is not how the English justice system works at the time. Most prosecutions are private, which means that it is up to the victim of the crime or kin of the victim, if the victim themselves is dead or a woman, etc., uh, to not only organize the prosecution, but to raise money for rewards and legal expenses as well. So if you have a crime committed against you, it is on you to organize the actual prosecution of the crime, which may mean further expense and difficulty. So it works like a civil suit in the U.S. today where the government is just sort of a mediator between two parties, not like a criminal case where we have like a DA's office that would handle that sort of prosecution. Yes, although uh, the, the government cannot put you to death for civil suits in the United States. That would make our legal system significantly wilder P PVP. So... If you get to the point that you are even on trial for a crime, your victim has to be willing to go to significant lengths and expense to even get to the point where there's a possibility that you're going to be punished. A lot of people just aren't going to spend more money trying to recoup money from minor property crimes. But let's say someone does go through the trouble of prosecuting you. Even if you're convicted... And even if the law you are convicted under is a capital offense, there is a chance that you are not going to swing for it. Because when it comes to deciding guilt in the English court system, 
local magistrates have a lot of discretionary power. They even have so much discretionary power, they are allowed to dismiss cases if they feel like it. Uh, as a matter of fact, pretty much everyone involved in the legal system has some discretionary power. I like this quote from legal historian John Beattie, who describes the actual functioning of this system in the 18th century as, quote, shot through with discretionary powers. Indeed, it could hardly have worked had it not been. So basically, this system is so complex and confusing um, and so potentially harsh if you get the worst possible punishment that there are a lot of potential points along the way where the, a magistrate can say, you know what, I'm not putting you to death for this one. Almost like maybe you want to consider revising the whole thing, but I guess that approach works too. And of course, there is another feature of the English legal system that comes into play in criminal trials, because when it comes to deciding guilt and to deciding a sentence, we are not just talking about a magistrate who is making that decision. A lot of cases that are prosecuted under the law are jury trials. And let's talk about juries. There's this little document you might have heard of signed in a 1215 called the Magna Carta. You might be aware of that one. Yeah, Robin Hood signed that, right? <laughs> um, if you watch that one, who was that Ridley Scott? That, that was one? also a that was a Robin oh, yeah. Ridley Scott right there. Uh, yeah, in the same fine vein as Napoleon, uh, if you're a Patreon subscriber. Another film that has something to say about history. Uh, do not get your history from Ridley Scott, but uh, do not get your history from a lot of people talking about the Magna Carta either, because you have probably heard people say that the Magna Carta is what grants people in England the right to trial by jury. That's sort of technically correct in a sense, but it's not actually the full picture of what happens. Uh, the Magna Carta is not the start of jury trials in England. Those actually started back in the 1100s, so well before that document was signed. And the interpretation of the Magna Carta as the document that grants people the right to a trial by jury actually involves some legal wrangling over the following centuries. So it's not just Magna Carta is signed, all English citizens immediately have this right. Uh, it takes quite a lot of legal process to get there. But it does get there by this era. So by this era, facing the judgment of your peers instead of solely the judgment of, the, of a representative of the state has been baked into the English justice system for a very long time. And I feel like we've been down on jury trials on this podcast in the past. Uh, we do tend to cover historically significant cases, and especially when you're talking about American criminal cases, a lot of those are historically significant because a biased jury made a decision that we consider unfair today. But jury trials do have an upside. In the previous legal system, so going all the way back to the 1100s, the 1200s, you might have something like a trial by ordeal in which only God or the priest who is standing in for God and choosing the temperature of the hot poker you're about to hold can grant you leniency. But in a trial by jury, you might just end up with a jury who decides on a more lenient interpretation of the law because they're sympathetic to you, or decides that you deserve a less harsh punishment because of extenuating circumstances. It is true that, uh, especially in early jury trials, that sympathy does tend to swing disproportionately towards the rich and influential. But the jury system does allow some flexibility in the way that all of these laws are applied in practice. So if you're feeling squeamish and you're a member of the jury uh, and you don't want to sen sentence a criminal to death for a crime that you think shouldn't be punishable by death, you do have some wiggle room. You can sentence them to transportation or imprisonment or some other punishment. And uh, when historian Peter King took a look at the ages of criminals along with the sentences that they received during the era of the Bloody Code, he found that there were some definite patterns in jury sentencing. Criminals on the younger and older ends of the spectrum were clearly getting leniency from jurors because on one hand, juries didn't really love sentencing teenagers to death. On the other hand, they didn't like sentencing people in their 30s and 40s who had families of their own to support. 
So there was clearly some leniency happening as jurors looked at convicts and said, like, oh, we, we don't really want to sentence people who are recently children themselves or have children dependent on them. I mean, that's very noble of them. I am a little hung up on the fact that your phrasing does imply people in their 30s and 40s are old. <laughs> By the standards of the time, I mean, you would you by that point, you would have some kids and a wife and uh, you would have some people dependent on you usually as a general rule. Yes. All right. Well, I'm going to go play, play some shuffleboard while I think about that. <laughs> so even if you do go through this entire process, you are prosecuted, you're tried and you are sentenced to death. There is a good chance that you are not actually going to the gallows to die. Because this is also a system where pardons are an option. So how good are your chances? There's been a lot of scholarship analyzing exactly how good your odds of getting a pardon are. And the later in time you go, the better your chances of getting a pardon get. And again, your age also has to do with your likelihood of getting a pardon or a reduced sentence. Young people are awfully good workers, and there are British colonies that need a supply of transported criminals for their labor forces. It just seems like this, in particular, this justice system was especially harsh on uh, young men without a steady op occupation and place to live. So, so guys in their 20s were really disproportionately being targeted. And if you weren't a man in your 20s, there's a much better chance of getting a par pardon. Sir Leon Rudinowitz, a criminologist and an academic, calculated in a study in the 1940s that in 1750, if you are convicted of a capital crime in London, your chances of actually being hanged are two in three. But by 1810, your chances of being hanged are only one in ten. That's how common pardons got. Other academic studies did find somewhat different results. Uh, one actually found a spike in executions in the 1820s, kind of an extinction burst of the state exerting more authority shortly before a lot of those offenses stopped being capital offenses in the 1830s. There's an argument that can be made that a significant factor in the end of the bloody code was the fact that the public understood that the law was not nearly as likely to kill you in practice as it sounded on paper. And politicians were actually worrying that the, the public's understanding of this was eroding trust in the state's authority. So some of the eventual shrinking of the list of capital offenses was actually just the law on paper being rewritten more in line with the law as it was actually being practiced. I mean, that is interesting. I can see, obviously, the desire not to just execute a boatload of people. Like, that just seems counterproductive and also somewhat morally suspect, to put it mildly. Uh, but it's kind of funny that it does have the kind of knock-on effect of people just assuming, well... It says all this on paper, but actually I'm not in that much danger. <laughs> yeah, it is a really weird system to have to deal with as a politician. On one hand, the state has these very, very harsh laws on the books. On the other hand, the public is really starting to cotton on, especially as this is also kind of the, the rise of the era of uh, newspapers and of true crime reporting. The public's really starting to cotton on that what they're being told the law is versus what in practice the law is are very different things. Does this mean that this was a good legal system to live under and that few people died? Absolutely not. A lot of people were still executed by the state, many for property crimes, some for crimes that we don't even consider crimes today, like consensual sodomy. And it's also pretty arbitrary, too, right? Depending on how lucky you are with a jury or how lucky you are with a magistrate who's feeling forgiving. Oh, yes, very much so. Also, where in Britain you were. Um, I think London was considered harsher than a lot of the more provincial yeah. areas. I mean, I've already forgotten the place where I'm not allowed to forge anything, which is not great. <laughs> I don't want to accidentally, you know, don't want to accidentally mix that up. So death was disproportionately likely to be doled out to struggling young adults, some of whom had had to turn to crime to survive during one of the greatest eras of disruption to the employment system in the entirety of human history. 
And uh, even those who weren't executed face punishments that we would consider inhumane today, like transportation to penal colonies across the ocean, whipping, the pillory. We've already gone over how very badly those things sucked. So you're implying that it's basically the conclusion here is it's not as violent a system as we sometimes portray it as, which is not the same thing as saying what a great moment in English legal history Absolutely. Yeah. I'm so I'm correcting the record of how this law was practiced while also saying, if you look at the statutes from this period, uh, let's just say they, they were indeed written in blood. But if capital punishment wasn't actually being doled out in real life as often as it could be on paper, how does this era get the name the bloody code and why do we remember it as such a harsh period of British law? That's because the name for this period is actually coined not when these laws start, but when they start getting rolled back. Because in the 1800s, reformers start campaigning to change the whole criminal justice system, pretty much every part of it they're campaigning to change. They want to change how prisons get built and how they're run. They want to change who gets sent there and for how long. And they don't believe that the state's practice of publicly executing criminals is moral or effective at actually deterring crime, which in fairness, absolutely right on the money on that one. As reformer Elizabeth Fry wrote in 1818, quote, It is frequently said by the prisoners of Newgate that the crimes of which they have been guilty are as nothing when compared with the crimes of government towards themselves, that they have only been thieves but that their governors have been murderers. All right there, comrade. Slow your roll. <laughs> I mean, this is the era of some pretty radical reform. No, it is It is very, uh, I mean, a, fair, a fairly made point. I'm thinking back on some of the old cases we've done from the kind of bloody code era. And even the executions mostly just made people into celebrities, right? which is presumably not the intention that you want. Well, the idea was that they're, they're a celebrity in the sense that they will be well-remembered for the, the gruesomeness of their death and that you won't, you won't follow them into a criminal life because you remember how badly they died. I mean, I'm sure that's the theory, but I'm remembering some of the... Oh, fuck, I'm forgetting her name. The, um, the con artist we did that, like, many years ago. Yeah, I'm remembering some previous cases where, like, the... Um, Outside of Newgate, as these people are being executed, there are like vendors hawking pamphlets with outrageous stories of the crimes they committed that, yeah, are talking about the executions, but also are like treating the crime itself as entertainment, which presumably, again, kind of not not the TMZ approach you want. Oh, 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 you've hit on something that I really wanted to talk about. So thank you for giving me that segue. Let's talk about crime as entertainment. This is the start of the era of the, the newspaper and mass media as we understand it. When exactly true crime really gets going, uh, you can sort of pin that on a lot of different potential moments in history. We've talked about those Japanese true crime puppet shows. Uh, but this is definitely the era where people are consuming uh, stories about crime as entertainment and newspapers are very happy to go with if it bleeds it leads um so the public is aware of and able to comment on crime in a way that they just had not been able to in previous centuries and that actually is a really really big boon for the reform movement because uh politicians can really see the public starting to question whether we should be putting people to death for some of these crimes. And particularly, there's some, sensa there's some pretty sensational forgery trials in the uh, 1830s, 1820s, 1830s. And there's a lot of public questioning of whether we should be putting forgers to death happening in newspapers. And that starts leading to some political reform. So slowly, slowly, reformers start chipping away at this list of capital crimes, and they are able to have new laws passed that little by little start narrowing that circle of crimes that can be punishable by death. So they're reversing the way that circle got expanded so much in the, uh, at the beginning of the Bloody Code. They're starting to pass new statutes that narrow it again. And it works. 
By 1861, reformers managed to shrink that circle down to just five crimes, and those are murder, treason, espionage, arson in royal dockyards, and piracy with violence. And while they're doing this, they are also working to reduce the brutality of the executions that are still happening. Uh, So more gruesome methods like beheading and quartering get banned. The minimum age at which a criminal can be executed is raised. And they do manage to prevent executions from happening in public in front of a crowd. So the idea of an execution being a public spectacle is no longer an option for politicians. Probably for the best, yeah. Oh, yeah. It takes a very long time to abolish the death penalty in Britain, but it does happen. The last execution in Britain takes place in 1964. But do you do you want to guess when the death penalty actually gets abolished in Britain? You want to give me a decade on that one? I mean, be after that point, I'll guess the mm-hmm. 90s? Oh, you got it. Yeah, 1998. Okay. So the Crime and Disorder Act and the Human Rights Act finally get rid of the last remaining instances in which the death penalty could be applied for treason, piracy with violence, and certain kinds of military espionage. So you see how there there are a couple of often military criminal codes are uh, particularly unusual and they kind of need separate acts to clean everything up. But the death penalty is completely abolished in Britain now. And it's time for me to fly the Jolly Roger and start pirating from the King's (laughs) Navy once again. That's right. Oh, and I can finally poach in the King's Forests, too. That's right. You can't be executed in Britain, but you can still be executed in many of Britain's former colonies. I'm going to get a little political here. Shocking. I know. I never get political. Well, history is inherently apolitical, as we all know. (laughs) I would say that the last vestiges of the Bloody Code survive not in Britain itself, but in its former colonies, many of which carried elements of British law over into their own criminal justice systems. Here in America, 21 states do allow the death penalty, with another six that currently have a pause on executions by executive action. So I thought, To cap off this episode, why don't we have a nice little lighthearted chat about when, if ever, the state should kill its own citizens. And if we don't think the state should kill its own citizens, what should the state be doing with them instead? I mean, isn't that fundamentally a question of what the the purpose of criminal justice is more than anything else? Like, Yes, follow my leading question. Yes. Keep on going, philosophy teacher. Oh my god. So... You're asking me what my personal opinion is here. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, I mean, I tend to follow the lead of, I God, I think it was Bentham? Who, like, Jeremy Bentham, who I think said in... I Oh, Lord, it's been too long. I think it was in the Principles of Moral Legislation, or one of... Oh, God, he has, like, several writings that all have the same name. Basically that like utilitarian approaches are good, like are designed for matters of public policy first and foremost, and then for personal morality. I wouldn't call myself. I'm Hey, you started this. I'm finishing it. (laughs) Um, I wouldn't call myself a utilitarian in terms of my personal ethics, but I think it broadly makes sense as a starting point for legislation. And I have a hard time imagining a utilitarian case for the death penalty except if killing people who committed really heinous crimes was cheaper than keeping them alive. I'm so glad. I'm so glad that you brought up Jeremy Bentham. I've led you straight into my trap. What the fuck trap could you lay with Jeremy Bentham? Is it still a crime to steal his head or something? We will get into this in the next episode. We will get into this. Oh, because he's the the panopticon and all that shit. (laughs) Oh, God. Because... If the purpose of criminal sentencing is not actually punishment, if that is not what is best for the populace, can the purpose of your justice system be rehabilitation? Can you sentence someone to become a better person? Can you turn your justice system into a factory that takes criminals in and puts out law-abiding citizens? Wouldn't that be best for your population? Wouldn't it? I, yeah, and I'm sure that nothing problematic can emerge from trying to 
remold people in your own image without any without their input or consent. Yes. If you believe that this is something that your justice system can do in a theory, isn't that such an amazing goal that it justifies doing just about anything to your prisoner population if it's going to cure them of their criminal tendencies? Yeah, I don't like where this is going. Oh, you are not going to like where it's going because next time on Criminal Records, we are going to talk about Victorian prison reform and we are going to talk about the things that very well-intentioned people did under the belief that they were rehabilitating the criminal populace. I feel like you could you could say the sentence, we're going to talk about Victorian X reform and whatever the X is, it would just be bad. Okay, you know what? In fairness, in fairness, the Victorians here have successfully managed to reform a pretty heinous era of English laws. Oh, yeah, it's be- it's better than the literal bloody code. Okay. Yes. And further in fairness, as we'll talk about in the next episode, they have some unprecedented issues that the the British legal system has never had to deal with before and suddenly gets dumped in the lap of prison reformers. And they're cleaning up a uh, pretty significant mess. So we'll talk about that in the next episode. We'll talk about some very wacky things that some extremely well-intentioned people tried out of the sincere belief that they were making the justice system better. All right. Well, that's some excellent foreshadowing for next time. Uh, But we should probably wrap things up here. So in the meantime, if people would like to remind us which writings of England it's still illegal to forge in, because I don't want to make that mistake if I ever visit, where can they find us? You can find us on FacingBackward.com. We also have a Patreon, Patreon.com slash FacingBackward, where you can get ad-free episodes, all kinds of fun bonus content, hear us talk about how angry we are at Ridley Scott. Uh, And if you're feeling particularly generous, you can join our Patreon at the shout-out tier. The shout-out tier patrons are Yan Leonard, Stephen Elkins, Martin Oliveira, Clark Canning, Ian Kellett, Matt Haynes, Jackie Frostocker, Monkey Sack, Alayla McCulloch, Karen Murphy, Peter Wales, Robert Prine, William Arno, Jonas Brandis, Nicholas Kroll, Jerry Spinrad, Jared Stevens, Jeffrey Dwork, Stefan Hrushka, Joshua Kane, Robbie and Cat, Jacob Key, Aaron Finkbeiner, and Anonymous Anna's Hummingbird, Mark Sai, Gil, Leslie Ikuta, Trash Taste Enjoyer, John, Christopher, Harrison Reese, Inoue Enrio's Ghostbusters, Nihongo Kaizen.com, Shimao Toshio's History of Japanese Podcast, A House Is, A Perfectly Cromulent Mascot, The Fish I Catch Are, Road Scholars, Compared to Samuel Alito, Schmuck, and uh, speaking of great jurisprudence, and Everything Changed When the Fire Nation Attacked. Until next time, folks, if you have to forge land registers, do it outside the North Riding of Yorkshire. But remember, there's no, there's no death penalty for piracy anymore, folks. Open season, baby.